بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقى قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله good to see you guys again uh, so الحمد لله last time you know we finished up uh, right around um, we were still in the introduction of our book, Psychology, reading from, reading from Psychology from the Islamic Perspective by Dr. Aisha Utz. And last time we just kind of um, ended where we had, we gave the definition of psychology from the Islamic perspective. And what is psychology from the uh, Islamic perspective? We, we kind of said that it is the study of the soul. So it's essentially the study of the soul um, and that is the uh, the foundation, the basis for psychology within the Islamic paradigm, alhamdulillah. And so today, you know, we were going on to critique uh, secular side. We were, uh, you know, the author was critiquing secular psychology uh, and how, you know, it's problematic when we we consider it with the Islamic uh, Islamic religious, you know, paradigm. And so we stopped at, you know, science and the scientific method how basically Western secular psychology is um, is based upon the science and the scientific method and how that can you know pose some problems from Muslims who are trying to understand psychology. And so continuing our reading, uh, the author goes on to say, under the section science and the scientific method, psychology has attempted to assert itself as a science by embracing the scientific method, attempting to prove its theories mm -hmm. Using the scientific method, researchers make observations of human phenomena and then form theories. A theory attempts to explain a behavior and mental processes through an integrated set of principles that organizes and predicts. From these theories, they produce predictions or hypotheses that are then tested. Research, researchers then test these hypotheses and either validate, revise, or reject the theories. So essentially, basically, it's describing how the scientific method essentially works. An interesting point that we should all know, the scientific method was actually developed by the Muslims. Uh, the, the method itself, it was, it was kind of co-opted by, you know, the, the Europe and the Western powers, but it was essentially uh, developed uh, by the Muslims. And we, we can go back and you guys can do some homework and look into it, but it's, it's interesting that it comes from, comes from the, uh, the Muslims uh, coming up with hypotheses and then developing a research design that tests whether the hypothesis is true or, you know, not true. And so, you know, what's the problem when we use the scientific method and we apply it to a soft science like psychology? So, you know, psychology is not like physics or chemistry. It doesn't deal with like numbers and data and, you know, tangible things like that. Uh, psychology is the study of the soul, right? The Greek word, again, we said psyche. Psyche means from the Greek word, the root word, study of the soul. The study of the soul isn't about data and numbers. It's a lot more complex. There's, there's emotions, behaviors, internal processes. You know, all of these things are very complex. The human behavior, thoughts, and all of, you know, all of these things are very complex. And if, you tr we, if we try to apply the scientific method to a soft science with complex human behavior, our results are, are going to have issues. And the author is going to talk about what the, these issues are. So she goes on to say one of the limitations of the scientific method is the limited focus on the physical world and almost complete disregard for spiritual aspects of the human being. So the scientific method essentially deals with the five senses, what we can observe using our five senses. And this becomes a problem because we can only, we are limited to the physical world and what we can see and what we can experience through our physical senses, our five senses. And so that becomes a problem because there's a complete disregard for spiritual aspects of the human being. There is no regard for the soul. There's no concept. There's no scientific uh, explanation for the soul or the ruh or anything like that. So it becomes problematic. So scientists, so essentially, given that we're only able to, you know, science and the scientific method is only able to account for uh, just the physical aspects of the human being. Now we're only essentially in truth we understand as Muslims that these scientists are only studying a part of the human being and not the complete person. 
Because if we only study the behaviors and the thoughts and the behaviors and, you know, these things, you know, that's part of us. Behaviors, emotions are a part of who we are. But without the soul, without the ruh, the, scient the scientists are only starting a, a, a very small portion or, 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 or a portion, and it's incomplete. It's an incomplete study. And so the theories that result from it, we have to be very critical of these theories and actually be critical of the premise instead of just accepting their premise. We have to, you know, analyze them to the Quran and Sunnah, see if we can even, you know, if, if they can be validated or, you know, whether we can, uh, you know, accept them. So one classic example of this is behaviorism. So what is behaviorism? It's a school of thought that reflects the obvious limitations of the scientific method. Badri, and this is, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Malik Badri is a huge, huge, um, you know, personality in the field of Islamic psychology. He explains that there is a school of thought called the behavioral, uh, behaviorist school of thought. They introduced a very new approach. They said you could study, you know, you can you can have stimu stimuli, meaning you can you know invoke something like like a stimulus, and then it will lead to a response, and that can be observed and that can be recorded. So it's scientific in that way. So behavior can be studied by inducing a stimulus and then observing the response and then recording the results. And so, <clears throat> because you know it's only related to what can be observed, you know, with our senses, things like feelings, you know, mental processes. Um, you know, so so feelings, and also um, says feelings, the components of the mind, the process of thinking were considered questions that could not be observed directly. And so the methods used to study them, such as introspection, observation, and reporting of inner experience, these things, the behavior school of thought said, we can't talk about feelings and emotions and thought processes and internal experience. We, we can't really talk about this because we can't, you know, study them fr from a scientific standpoint. So, you know, these things were actually disregarded in the behavior, behavior school of thought. And so these were criticized as being vague and unreliable, and they could not be controlled by experimental procedure. So therefore, the behaviorists who wanted psychology to become an exact experimental science like physics and chemistry, they restricted their work to phenomena that could be observed in the lab and the responses could be measured and controlled, and that became the fo focus of their, you know, experimental and scientific concerns. And so we see, we see the the obvious, the obvious issues uh, with the behaviorist school of thought, which was a major school of thought, you know, uh, a couple of decades ago. And so, you know, Badri goes on to explain the shortcomings of this approach. He says that behaviorism denies the innate goodness or evilness of humans while maintaining that what they believe is neither true nor false. So now this is going to be a critical piece here. They say something very interesting. So the behaviorist, behavior, behavioral uh, psychologists, they say that nature, values, and beliefs are determined entirely by environmental events with no room for global truths or moral standards. Let me say that again. So behaviorists say that values, beliefs are determined by environmental events, things around us, whatever's happening around us determines our behavior. <clears throat> and there's no, there's no moral truth. There's no global truth. There's no, you know, there's no absolute truth. Everything is a result of our environment and we are a product of our environments. And so this theory excludes any notion of freedom of choice or conscious moral decision-making. So they say that, you know, there is no freedom of choice because everything is due to the events and the environment around us that leads to certain behaviors and we have no control over, you know, whatever the external environmental influences are that dictates our behavior. There is no such thing as, you know, global moral truths, global, uh, global truths, moral truths. And, um, you know, you know, every, everyone, you know, <clears throat> basically, uh, so, so, so this is, this is what, this is what they go on to say. And last time, you know, we talked about um, you know, nihilism, sensationalism, materialism. We talked about all these isms and what, what the essential, you know, a lot of the problems, you know, that, that you know, that they pose to modern day, you know, you know uh, society in terms of materialism, sensationalism, um, nihilism, and, 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 and re relativism, and all of these, all of these other, um, you know, com contemporary modern theories. And so, <clears throat> so she goes on to state that reliance on scientific method has led to flawed, deficient, and co contradictory theories 
and conclusions, which have led many people astray regarding the nature of humans. Um, so because scientific method is limited to, you know, the five senses, and that can only be observed through the five senses, it disregards, you know, for those who just joined us, we're talking about how the scientific method uh, is kind of limiting uh, the study of the entire human being by focusing only on the part that's observable by the senses and, you know, the five senses and the human behaviors that can be observed and be experimented and controlled. And it, there's a complete disregard in this school of thought uh, regarding the soul and, you know, inner feelings, reporting of inner experience, emotions, and all of these things, because these things cannot be qualita uh, uh, quantitatively measured or controlled for in experiments. So they were criticized and uh, disregarded. And so she goes on to say that <clears throat> another limitation of psychological science is most of the research and theories have been based upon a limited segment of the human population, which is primarily American and European. So this is also an issue when a lot of the theories that are coming out of psych modern day Western, you know, secular psychology, if they're primarily based on an American European uh, Western, you know, uh, societies and these populations, although this trend is now kind of changing and we do have, you know, more Asian and, you know, other countries, African countries starting to kind of, you know, do, start doing, you know, psychological research as well. But this had been, you know, for the longest time, it was a lot of these theories and, you know, ideas were coming out of the West. And we know that the Western societies, uh, all of these, um, you know, uh, the Western society tends less to believe, uh, tends to believe less in God and religion. And this is reflective in, uh, reflected in the, their behavior, thoughts, and emotions. So if you look at, you know, our contemporary society in the West, uh, a lot of it is, you know, um, devoid of, you know, religion and God and, um, you know, you know, things like that. So the question arises, what is considered normal? Psychologists assume that shared characteristics of research participants reflect normality, but how accurate is this assumption? So she goes on to say, you know, researchers are happy as long as the research participants have shared characteristics, their the ages are similar, their genders are similar, maybe their socioeconomic status is similar. As long as they have, you know, uh, a decent number of similarities, you know, that will, that will reflect normality. Um, but, you know, how accurate is his assumption? Basically, there's a new field that's called cross-cultural or cultural psychology that actually questions this assumption. And now scientists are beginning to understand that what may be normal in one society, what may be normal in one society may not be applicable to other societies. For example, a social norm, you know, here in the West, you know, and if we have participants that, uh, you know, are are doing, a, there, there's a research study being done here in the West and the participants, you know, are, are, they have a lot of shared characteristics, but, you know, if you take that research design and you take that experiment and then you take the theories that come out of that and you say, this also applies to Africa, this applies to Asia, this applies to the Middle East, um, that becomes a problem because, you um, what's normal in the US and Europe and you know uh, North America may not be normal in Africa and Middle East and Asia. So we can't extrapolate and generalize findings um, from one society to you know, ge generalize th throughout the rest of the world is what she's saying. Um, and so she, she goes on to say, this is an important point to consider when attempting to extrapolate the research findings of Western science in Islamic societies. It doesn't mean we discard all conclusions, but we must view all of them critically and skeptically uh, through the lens of Quran uh, and Sunnah, first and foremost. And now we're going to get into, you know, knowledge and scholarship from the Islamic perspective. So this section, uh, she goes on to talk about, you know, what is, you know, what is um, what is our sources? What is our epistemology? What are the Islamic sources of knowledge and scholarship from the Islamic perspective? So she says, in an Islamic framework, it is the revelation from the creator that becomes the primary and most fundamental source of understanding. Allah knows us better than we know ourselves. To, uh, so to disregard revelation, particularly in area of psychology, is sheer ignorance. So if I were to quest, if I were to throw a pop pop question out here, a quiz, uh, you know, for for uh, see who may know this. Um, if I say, what verse in the Quran, you know, 
uh, we'll, except it's not used, so we'll, we'll let the youth participate, inshallah. What verse in the Quran can uh, you know, tell us that Allah knows us better than we know ourselves? If someone had to think of a verse in the Quran where Allah mentions that he knows us better than we know ourselves, what, do you, what, do you, what, what can you guys come, come up with? Huh? Huh? Um, I would say, um, I, I will give a hint. It's in Juz Tabarak. It's, it's the first surah in Juz Tabarak. What do, you, what do you got? Well, what's the first surah in Juz Tabarak? Right. Yeah, it's a, so so is, is there a verse in Surah Mulk that, that may say something that, that Allah knows us, that may, maybe one of the attributes of Allah that he knows us so well? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm sorry. What she? I'm sorry. What did she say? Inshallah. Inshallah. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Zakla khair. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Mashallah. So uh, in Surah Mulk, Allah says, "Does He who created not know those whom He created, while He is the subtle, the acquainted?" You know the the, the uh, Allah's attributes, Allah tif. You know, it, it's it's deep, and you know, I, I, this is not my field. You know, I'm not a sheikh or, or anything like that. Ustad Yusuf can tell you guys about that, or Sheikh Fasih. But um, you know, Allah, Allah knows us, and and what's deep inside our hearts, or even what's in our subconscious that we may not even be aware of ourselves. Allah knows that about us, and so and so our source of knowledge begins firstly with 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 the revelation, because this is our you know a guidebook, our manual. Our compass. This is exactly what it is. And then Allah tells us that He's aware is what in our soul. Allah tells us that He is aware of what is in our souls and hearts. Uh, Allah says in Surah Qaf, and we have already created uh, humankind and known what His soul whispers to Him, and we are closer in knowledge to Him than His jugular vein. Subhanallah. You know, subhanallah. So you know, again, th th this is this is this is powerful. Allah also says. And conceal your speech or publicize it. Indeed, he knows all of that. He knows all of that within the breasts. Whether we conceal it, whether we reveal it, whether we're not even aware of it, Allah is aware of all of it. SubhanAllah. So revelation, she, she goes on to say, revelation is the foundation upon which all knowledge is built. It is perfect and complete. This reflects the Muslim's firm and unwavering belief in the scripture, the Quran, as the final revealed word of Allah, a conviction that is unique to Islam. One of the first verses in the Quran notes that, that notes this fact. Uh, Allah says in Surah Baqarah, this is a book about which there is no doubt. A guidance for those who are conscious of Allah. So when, you know, subhanAllah, I remember Imam Ayyub saying, you know, maybe a couple of weeks ago, you know, and Allah starts, uh, starts off the Quran by saying that this is a book that there is no doubt. And this is from Allah, you know, like there, there is no doubt anything in this book is clear, the minor, major, everything is clear, and there is no doubt about anything that this book contains, and it's a guidance for those who are conscious. Um, so now, also, in addition to the Quran, uh, the statements or actions of the Prophet Muhammad, you know, the, the, the ahadith are also considered to be part of revelation and our second to the quran in significance it is only through revelation that we comprehend the true nature of the soul and the unseen world and ascertain the methods for purifying the soul and developing it to its fullest potential allah is the only one with uh, allah is the only one with authentic and complete knowledge of the unseen world so we turn to him for this understanding human beings especially muslims must not speculate or guess in relation to this domain uh, and Kamali wrote, now this is an interesting uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic point, which, which makes a very, uh, very important point, uh, which is our belief as Muslims. So Kamali writes, the proofs of Sharia have been divided into transmitted proofs and rational proofs. So the proofs for any legislation or Islamic law, there are two types of proofs, either transmitted through, you know, scripture and, you know, Quran, Sunnah, Jama'ah. Or they're rational proofs. That means they they uh, 
they're rational, like we're able to rationalize whatever the ruling might be, we're able to think about it and rationalize it. And that, you know, also supports it. Um, so th they say the authority of the transmitted proofs is independent of their conformity or otherwise with the dictates of reason. So transmitted proofs are independent and they don't need rational, they don't need, um, they don't need rational reasoning for them to be accepted. They have to be accepted. Um, you don't need reason to accept transmitted truths and transmitters are from Quran, Sunnah, Jama'ah. When those things are established, it doesn't matter what reasons agrees with it or not. It doesn't matter. These are independent. Transmitter truths are independent. Um, but most of uh, most of transmitter truth uh, truths are also can also are, are actually also rationally justified as well. So you know they are transmitted, but a lot of most of them can also be rationally justified as well. Um, the authority and binding of force of the Quran, Sunnah, the Jama'ah are independent of any rational justification that might exist in their favor. The rational proofs, on the other hand, are founded in reason and need to be ra uh, rationally justified. They can only be accepted by virtue of their rationality, but rationality alone is not an independent proof in Islam. Meaning just because something is a rational proof, that by itself does not, um, is that's not an independent proof. It still needs, um, it, it's still dependent on the transmitted truths according to the Quran and Sunnah. Um, so, 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 so that's what this is. She, she goes on that another, um, you know, another um, jurist made this point. So then he goes on to explain that this point is clear in Sharia and that it is addressed to the competent person who possess, possesses the faculty of reasoning. The complete Sharia does not impose any obligation upon humans that would contradict the requirements of reason or intellect. So Alhamdulillah, the Sharia, you know, it's, it, it, it doesn't, you know, I can't think of very many examples, if any, um, you know, where the Sharia would co uh, contradict um, reasoning or intellect, except one, uh, there's something comes off the top of my head. You know, I, I think the companions once asked, um, you know, usually, usually when the mas'a is made over, over the sock, you know, it's the bottom of the feet that get dirty. Why do we make mas'a over the top? And, uh, I, you know, and, and, and so it was said, you know, that's, not, it, it's, 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 it's irrelevant. This is where it doesn't matter what our, the reasoning says. Whatever was, you know, whatever the prophet, you know, depicted and showed and exhibited, that, that, that's it. After that, you know, whether it, you know, it comes to, we submit, we submit to the transmitted uh, proofs, Quran, Sunnah, Ijma'ah, doesn't matter if something makes sense to us or not, otherwise, alhamdulillah, we, but for the most part, for most, all of uh, legislation is in, is in um, harmony with the reason and intellect, alhamdulillah. So just, just because we're giving prior to the revelation does not mean that Muslims ignore or neglect science and reason at, as is evident in previous discussion about the role of reason in Islamic law. The Quran itself, as well as various ahadith, urge, urges humans to contemplate the universe and to seek knowledge or revelation. But revelation should be the criteria by which we judge the developing sciences. I'm going to say this again. This, this part is important. And I, under, I underlined it. Revelation should be the criteria by which we judge the developing sciences, not the other way around. We all we always we we all get impressed, like you know James, you know James Webb telescope pictures, and you know I don't know, you know the universe. The NASA just found out the universe is expanding. Oh, that's in the Quran, and now now we're impressed because NASA just said, oh yeah, by the way, the universe is expanding. You know, oh yes, we you know the Quran says that. Oh wow, mashallah! You know, and, and we all get very excited anytime a scientific uh, new finding um, is in harmony with the Quran or Sunnah. But you know, that's not how our mindset should be. The mindset should be that you know whatever is in the Quran and Sunnah is our benchmark, and if science is is keeping up with it, alhamdulillah. If if science uh, has not yet either discovered it or if it goes, it contradicts the Quran and Sunnah then there has been a mistake and an error in the scientific method or the scientific process. And, and that's it. And there's a mistake in this, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, the science of a hundred years ago is a difference from the science today. The science of a hundred years from now will be the difference from the science today. The, the, our, the miracle of the Quran is the consistency. 
it does not, will not, cannot ever change. It's up to us, you know, and, and Allah says he will protect it. And so, you know, I, I know it's exciting, you know, for, for the youth to talk to their, you know, friends about, oh, you know, this is the Quran. This is the, right. But alhamdulillah, you know, what's, what's impressive is the Quran and Sunnah and, and, and not, you know, the science. Because ultimately, the, all sources of knowledge, you know, secular or otherwise, are within, you know, our, our Islamic discourse, alhamdulillah. And they were never separated. Back in the days, secular sciences, you know, and the religious, uh, religious teachings and education, the system was all together. You know, that's why we had all of these scholars who were astronomers and doctors, and there were scholars of fiqh and all of these other things. They were everything in one because this separation uh, came as a result of colonial, uh, col colonialism and imperialism, where, you know, uh, uh, religion was separated from, you know, um, fr from, it was church and state, it, you know, they said they can't coexist because they had problems with it uh, in Europe. And so, you know, that's, that's how the, you know, they understood it. And that's what they kind of promoted throughout the world and all of the colonies. And that, that's how, you know, the, the Islamic sciences became separated from secular sciences. And now they're essentially Islam does not distinguish between Islamic science and other sciences. These are all created by Allah. Um, and so reasoning becomes secondary to these primary sources. When we allow human reasoning to be the criteria, chaos ensues. This is powerful because the, the, you know, the assumption is that we have, you know, like this unlimited or like this perfect reasoning, the human being, our reasoning is very limited. Uh, you know, it, our reasoning has limits and, you know, beyond a certain point, our reasoning doesn't really help. And so, and, you know, with what's available to us today, the technology and all of these things. And so when we use our reasoning to be the criteria, you know, of all gl global moral truths, she says chaos ensues. And this is evident in the writings of philosophers who straight from the evidence into the realm of uh, imagination. So again, I think she's making the point here that I just said, in Islam, there is no separation between religious and secular as is, as is found in other systems. The sciences must be treated as a trust and should be assessed from the perspective of Islam. And that's it. Uh, scientific discoveries are only made through the grace and mercy of Allah. It is he who provides us with the minds and resources and the tools needed to conduct this research, discover and develop. Through these discoveries, we come to appreciate Allah's power and glory in the universe. Knowledge will also establish that universe is governed by laws in an orderly fashion rather than chaotically or by chance. If the science is correct, if the science is correct, it will conform with it will confirm what Allah has revealed to us. And there are several examples in modern psychological research where this is the case. If for some reason there's a contradiction, this signifies an error has entered into the scientific process or analysis. So, you know, like, again, everything, everything comes down to, you know, our, our benchmark or our, our gauge is, you know, our, um, is revelation and whatever is in harmony with the Quran and Sunnah, we accept and whatever is not in harmony, um, then we have to basically be really critical and figure out where, you know, th th there's a mistake that entered the scientific process. Um, so Zarbozo points out that from the perspective of Islam and the Quran, there are various branches of knowledge, one of which is related to the outward physical aspects of the cosmos. Knowledge of this realm of existence should lead people to the true metaphysical insight concerning the reality of creation, and it should direct them to acknowledge the existence of the creator as well as his greatness. So, you know, like if we look at the external, you know, you look at the universe, you look at all these discoveries, you look at the planets, the solar system, the galaxies, you know, all of these things. These, you know, Allah Sana mentioned in the Quran that, you know, we will surely show them our signs in the heavens and in the heavens and the earth and within themselves. You know, subhanAllah, when, when we reflect uh, on these creations of Allah, it 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 should naturally, it should naturally lead us to the conclusion that, you know, these things all are not here, you know, without purpose, without reason or chaotically. There's an organization, there's a precise organization to everything, the orbits, you know, the solar system in a precise orbit, it's tilted this many degrees. It's, you know, certain distance, you know, if it was a little bit closer, we'd be burnt. If we'd be a little bit further, we'd be frozen, you know, for, from, from the sun and all of these things. Like every, nothing is haphazard. And, you know, 
nowadays, you know, we create these robots and we call it like an intelligent design because they have all these sensors that are embedded in on all of these technologies. And then you look, if, if you ever dissect a hand and, you know, the, you know, people, you know, people who don't believe in God will say this is by chance, but when they design their robots and, you know, all the sensors they put on them, this is intelligent design, you know, well, what about the human being, you know, subhanAllah. So, 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 so that's what we have to come back to. Um, and so inability or unwillingness to accept God indicates deficiencies in the mindset of those who have attained that knowledge. So if, if people who explore the universe cannot come to the realization of the oneness of Allah after looking into the universe and looking within themselves, looking around them, then this shows that there is a, a deficiency in their mindset that could be from just environmental, could be, you know, whatever it might be, you know. And, um, you know, subhanAllah, um, uh, Allah talks about, have you not seen those who have taken their desires as their God, you know, and, and it doesn't mean desires, you know, uh, you know a, lot, a lot of time in intellectual discourse, you know, becomes, you know, a source of self-admiration and self, uh, you know, people become self-amazed because they've, you know, they, they've, they're, you know, I don't know, they, they become a major proof in a field or a certain field. And, and so people are very, I, I guess, self-amazed with their own theories and intellects and all of these things. And in, in my mind, you know, people might even worship their own intellects. They might just worship their own, you know, it's, it's not just, just desires like money and, you know, lust and, you know, power and greed. Yes, all of those things are desires, you know, but, you know, uh, you know, people desire fame, people desire recognition people desire um you know just just uh, being admired and so you know a, a lot of times we see all these news articles coming out oh this you know author you know or i mean this scientist at a prestigious institution fabricated hundreds of images or, or fabricated results in a huge study you know and um you know and and now their their paper was retracted they were banned from publishing for 10 years x y and z and so the so the truth is that you know we we all have desires and it's not just you know food money and greed and power and all of these things it could even be just you know just wanting you know fame and self amazement and self admiration um even if even if that means you know have or, or just you know if we have to skew and change and fabricate things just to keep all of those you know to to, to keep that status in society subhanallah so so with that you know um we we conclude our first chapter alhamdulillah so so this was the introduction uh to our chapter we um i i want to go a little briefly and before we do i just have um any any questions from the intro, uh, introduction chapter? Um, I, I, and I know it's every two weeks, so we may not, you know, recall, you know, everything that's kind of discussed, you know. Um, but does anyone have any questions from the initial introduction, which is just introduction to psychology? So let's. Oh yes, sister. I'm not gonna be able to hear. So someone, just tell me what she's saying. So, um, the knowledge that you get is the is the way 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 is the 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 or whether any any type of subject, but if it doesn't go against the Quran and the Sunnah, mm -hmm. then you still look into it from a different perspective. So if if um something clearly does not contradict the Quran and the Sunnah, can we uh can we accept it? Is that the question? So my answer would be ask a sheikh. <laughs> that, because now we're delving into the the world of the Islamic part of Islamic psychology. And um, uh, you know, I, I that's that's not you know, that's not something I want to comment on. I would I would ask 
Imam Ayub or you know, you know somebody qualified? Um, because that's, that's a great question. If something does not you know clearly contradict Quran and Sunnah, um, you know, can we accept it? Can we reject it? Um, um, I, I don't. I, I don't want to give like an Islamic answer to this because I'm not qualified to. I apologize. But what I can do is I know some people and I can find out and get back. Inshallah, they, they always say like you know for, come up with solutions. So I, I will ask this question to some of uh, my sheikhs and see if they can give me uh, an answer and I'll I'll get back to you, Inshallah. And I, maybe I'll post it in our Telegram group. Israel. What's your name? Yes, Ayub. Another you, mashallah. Well, yes, Akhi. Uh, so you said uh, how, how we all just want to have like daily stuff or just amuse ourselves. Don't we do that like every day? Like, don't we, like, um, let's say, let's say, um, let's say now you really want something bad in the day. So then you just go up, you go out by your own buy something in the game and there you go you have it and now you feel like you did did some you were like push your much work that you finally got it yeah i i heard i heard everything you said but what's the question yeah okay alhamdulillah exactly here for that comment okay um so i just want to start chapter two here briefly um, just read the, the, so this is an interesting chapter. This is mostly Islamic, the true nature of humans. This is a quite a lengthy chapter, but we'll start it today. Uh, and we'll stop. Um, we'll start about, we'll start uh, with a story, uh, lessons from the story of uh, Adam and Eve. And then we'll stop right before the fitrah, because I want to dedicate uh, the, the next uh, session to the fitrah and talk about the fitrah in detail and what it actually means. So um, chapter two, the true nature of humans. So as noted earlier, the secular perspective of psychology tends to view the basic nature of humans as being a combination of biological, cognitive means just thoughts, cognition just means thoughts. So biological, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral elements. In the Islamic conceptualization, however, the basic nature of, of humans is spiritual and metaphysical. So this is a very distinct um, you know, a difference between secular psychology and Islamic psychology that our building block uh, is actually, you know, spiritual and metaphysical and not just, you know, you know, bi bi biological DNA, genetics, thoughts and emotions. Those things are secondary, but the foundation is spiritual, like the ruh and the soul. Uh, in reality, psychology deals with the soul. The term psyche, in fact, comes from the Greek word for soul. We said that. Um, from the perspective of Islam, humans are dualistic, possessing both a body and a soul. The body is only a vehicle for the soul. The condition of our soul and the spiritual level that we attain affects our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. This is a major point. Um, the condition of our soul. You know, we talked about, you know, um, you know, nafs al-mutma'inna, nafs al-ammara, you know, you know, nafs al-lawama, all of these things. So the condition of our soul will impact and affect, you know, where, how our thoughts are, where our feelings are, and, you know, how we behave. Sisters can take a simple example when we're, it's the time of the month or postpartum or something like that, you know, when we can engage in salah and other things, you know, like it, it, it naturally impacts our, you know, our soul, you know, right? And, you know, maybe the iman is not the highest. In, in in certain you know in certain time at those at those times, and so you know this is so naturally we see that um, our spiritual levels um, affect all of these other things, and all of those other things actually also affect our spirit. So it, it's not just one way; it's like a multi right exactly and exactly it's it's all directional. It goes in all directions. So, so this is. Um, then she goes on to talk about the lessons from the story of Adam and Eve. To understand the true nature of humans, it is important we go back to the story of creation. As detailed in the Quran, we can glean a great deal of knowledge from this well-written story, knowledge that is beyond the realm of scientific theories and speculation. Um, Allah mentions, um, I would like someone to volunteer, uh, a brother, to volunteer to read Surah Baqarah, verse 30. If I say verse 30, 
you know, um, and, and I'll give you the beginning. I'll give you the beginning. And Allah, when and you, when your Lord said to the angels, I will be less. Let's hear it out loud. Bismillah. So um, yeah, this was this was, this is this is only nine 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 uh, verses. It, it seems longer, but it's only nine verses. So Allah mentions and mention of Muhammad when your Lord said to the angels, "Indeed, I will make upon the earth a successive authority." They said, "Will you place upon it the one who causes corruption therein and sheds blood while we declare your praise and sanctify you?" Allah said, "Indeed, I know that which you do not know." And He taught uh, Adam the names of all of them. Then he showed them to the angels and said, inform me of the names of these if you are truthful. They said, exalted are you. We have no knowledge except that which you have taught us. Indeed, it is you who is the knowing, the wise. He said, oh, Adam, inform them of their names. And when he had informed them of their names, he said, did I not tell you that I know the unseen of the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and what you conceal. And mention when we said to the angels, prostrate, prostrate before Adam. So they prostrated except for Satan. He refused and was arrogant and became of the disbelievers. And we said, O Adam, dwell you and your wife in paradise and eat therefrom in ease and abundance from wherever you will. But do not approach this tree lest you become, lest you be among the wrongdoers. But Satan caused them to slip out of it and remove them from that condition in which they had been. And we said, go down all of you as enemies to one another. And you will have upon the earth a place of settlement and provision for a time. Then Adam received, uh, then Adam received from his Lord some words, and he accepted his repentance. Indeed, it is he who is accepting of repentance, the merciful. We said, Go down from it, all of you. And when guidance comes to you from me, whoever follows my guidance, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. And those who disbelieve and deny our signs. Those will be the companions of the fire. They will abide therein eternally. Subhanallah. So 
so then she goes on to talk about um, the lessons about human beings from this part of the story. These verses provide the following lessons about human beings. There's six mentioned here. Number one, so human beings are unique in their creation and distinct from the creator. Humankind was placed on earth for a purpose, which is to worship Allah. So number two, they have a very significant and eminent role in the world as evidenced by Allah's order to the angels to bow down to uh, Adam, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. Humans are his successors on the earth and all of earth's resources have been made subservient to them. This is interesting, you know, subhanAllah. So the role of human beings on, on earth is significant and it's honorable because Allah ordered the angels to prostrate uh, to Adam alayhi salam. And so, so that shows that, you know, you know that human, the, the human beings have the potential to be superior to angels if they behave and act in accordance to the purpose of their creation, which is to worship Allah. Number three, they are blessed with valuable capabilities to match their positions. This includes the ability to understand, to intend or will something, to direct oneself to Allah, to follow his guidance, and to repent after committing errors. They also have weaknesses, number four, they also have weaknesses such as lowly desires, laziness, and forgetfulness that may lead them astray. Satan and his workers are always present, attempting to mislead them from the straight path. This is a continual struggle between human beings and these forces. They have the uh, number five, they have the potential to elevate themselves by submitting to guidance from Allah or to debase themselves by becoming heedless of that guidance and befriending shaitan. And last, number six, the key to salvation and happiness is in believing and following the guidance that comes from Allah. This will determine the value of this life and their status in the hereafter. And so this last part, um, last part is a little topic. She talks about the blessings from Allah and subservient of, uh, subservience of earth's resources. There are several verses in the Quran that feature uh, the honor and blessings that Allah bestowed upon human beings due to their position in, in this world. He has given us innate abilities to purify ourselves and to fulfill our purpose in this life. He has also blessed us with abundant provisions and subjected to us all that is, that is in the universe in order to ease our journey and to facilitate self-actualization. An element of this process entails the servant's gratitude for all of that, uh, all of that Allah has provided. For example, we see the sun. You know, we see without the sun, life is not possible. You know, the moon is used, can, can be used to calculate time. Um, you know, the stars serve a purpose right? Everything, the trees serve a purpose. Uh, you know, everything around us, the mountains serve a, you know, there you can talk about, you can give like lectures and lectures upon just mountains and their significance and how they stabilize the earth. They, you know, Allah says, you know, they act as pegs that hold the earth together. And if they weren't there, you know, it, it'd be kind of swaying and shaking and all sorts of things. And so everything, uh, Allah did all of this so, you know, the mountains are there. So there's not an earthquake every other second. So we can actually settle and live and do things and, you know, seek, you know, his sustenance and other things. So if we look at anything in nature, we will look at ourselves. You know, we have we have our human bodies. We have faculties. We have we have hearings. We have hearing sight. We have speech. We have cognition. We can understand things. Um, we have our biology. We have our immune system, you know, that, that's so complicated that you know it's like a world of its own you know subhanallah she's looking for her father okay so so subhanallah so she so she says that you know allah mentions again in surah mulk it is he who made the earth tame stable and subservient for you to walk amongst its slope and eat of his provision and to him is the resurrection in, in Surah Mulk again. And then another verse, you know, Surah Jatia, it is Allah who subjected to you the sea so that ships may sail upon it by his command and that you may seek his bounty and perhaps you'll be grateful. And he has subjected to you whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on earth 
all from him. Indeed, these are signs for a people who give thought. You know, if we, if we stop to think about, you know, um, before there were all these engines and other things, how could ships move on the ocean? You need wind. The sails are not going to, you know, the, these ships aren't going to go anywhere if there's no wind, you know. And so, and so it, you know, there, there's all these, all, all of these benefits for the human beings. And, uh, and here's an interesting point in Surah Asra, and I've heard some scholars take an interesting point away from it. I'm not going to confirm or deny it. But this verse in uh, Surah Isra says, we have certainly honored the children of Adam and carried them on land and sea and provided for them the good things and preferred them over much of what we have created with definite preference. I know a sheikh back in New York, you know, they asked him about aliens and he quoted this verse. He's like, Allah mentioned in the Quran in Surah Isra that we have preferred them over much of what we have created. He did not say we have preferred them over all of what we have created. Um, Allah, yeah, this, 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 you know, but this is, you know. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So yeah, there's a, that's beautiful. So Allah also says that, and Allah also mentioned there's things created that we would never know. Allahu Akbar. So yeah, who knows, you know, you know, aliens, parallel universe, Allahu Akbar, who knows? Uh, and then uh, the the last uh, the, the, the last uh, verse is it is Allah who created the heavens and the earth and sent down rain from the sky, and this is Surah Ibrahim. It is Allah who created the heavens and the earth and sent down rain from the sky and produced thereby some fruits as provision for you and subjected for you the ships to sail through the sea by His command and subjected for you the rivers and He subjected for you the sun and the moon continuous in orbit and subjected for you the night and the day. And he gave you from and he gave you from all that you have asked of him. And if you should count the favors, blessings of Allah, you could not enumerate them. Indeed, humankind is generally most unjust and ungrateful. You know, subhanAllah, um, this verse is it's a powerful verse. Allah talks about everything that he has created upon earth as, as a service as a service to us, subjected to us as a favor, as a blessing. And if we were to count his blessings and the scholars say, if I were to ask you guys, what is the smallest blessing, the least blessing, the smallest, most tiniest blessing from Allah? If you guys had to think of what could be the smallest blessing in our lives, what would you guys say? If, because I've heard scholars say something interesting about this. Yes, Akhi. What's your name? Muhammad? Omar? Alhamdulillah. Omar, tell me. Smallest blessing, huh? Sneezing, mashallah, that's good. Sneezing, you know, releases, you know, so sometimes bacteria and other things. Very good. But I, 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 um, so it's good. What, what's your name? Oh, Smallest blessing. Oh, you told me your name. Are you? Yes. Uh, I'm going to jack it backwards. Uh, Smallest blessing. Smallest blessing? Is that being a Muslim, becoming Muslim, or even being Muslim? That's the greatest blessing. Allah, becoming Muslim, Allah, you know, may Allah make us from the Muslims. I mean, the mu'minin. That, that, that's not small. That's huge. That's, you know, there, there's billions of people who don't have that. Yes. What's your name? Okay. Hamza? Another Hamza. Inshallah. Yes, Hamza. Huh? Blink. Blinking. Oh, I, that's deep. Mashallah. I, I, I like it. Blinking. What, what's the fun? What, what does blinking do? What does blinking do? And why do we need eyelashes? What does it do? Huh? Good. Mashallah. No, mashallah. I read that. That's very thoughtful. I really love that. What's your name, Akhi? Abdullah. That's got to be like the 10th Abdullah. Yes. Huh? Your teeth. Mashallah. What can't you do without your teeth? Chew. Alhamdulillah. Excellent. Food tastes different if you can't chew. That is, that is a scientific fact. Yes. What's your name? Luqman? MashaAllah, Luqman. Let's hear it. Let's hear this wisdom, Luqman. Smallest blessing. All right. All right. All right. What about the older, the elder youth, elder youth? You guys, can you guys take a smallest blessing? What can you guys think of? Anybody? Sister in the back. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, now we're getting philosophical. Allah, mashallah. No, yeah, I agree. I no, no, no. I, I, I don't. I, 
the question, the intent of this question is not to minimize any blessing, but the idea is there are blessings that are going on that we are actively kind of enjoying without even thinking about what we're enjoying. Huh? A thermos. Thumbs. Why specifically thumb? Okay. All right. So I remember I think my phone was like my hand can't hardly reach this. Okay. Can't open a door. Can't button up a shirt. So you no pincer grip. No pincer grip without the thumb. Mashallah. You know, babies at nine months learn to use the pincer grip. Without the thumb, you can't grip anything. So, all right. So 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 I, I, we're out of time. And I'm gonna. So so the scholars have said, you know, not not smallest as in like the 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 blessing is not significant, but they say. The smallest blessing or in terms of, you know, some blessings that we don't even think about is breathing a single breath. A single breath. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'm, I'm happy. So a single breath. How many, if we imagine the amount of breaths we take in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year, just in this session alone in one hour. Because I, when I work at the hospital, I see people on oxygen, on supplemental oxygen that can't breathe. You know, you might see some people outside with an oxygen tank, you know, in their backpack or they're on a wheelchair with an oxygen tank. Or, you know, COVID, COVID, right? Can't breathe, right? Shortness of breath. So the scholars say it's things that we don't even consider. And obviously all of these things are blessing. We blink to, you know, like take out, you know, like bacteria, you know, from the environment and other things and keep our eyes, you know, moist and lubricated and all, everything. And, and, and so, you know, Allah is saying in this verse in Surah Ibrahim, that you know, if you were to count the favors, you could not enumerate them. And you know, humankind is generally unjust and ungrateful because um, you know we use all of these blessings. We use first of all, we don't we're not we don't give the proper thanks. And what's worse is that we at times use these blessings to disobey to disobey our Creator. May Allah protect all of us. And so the last uh, point, and we'll end with this. She finishes this section by saying, without these provisions, we would struggle to accomplish our various tasks and to develop our communities, our nations, and ourselves. The sun provides us with the light and warmth. The sun and the moon allow us to calculate time. The earth enables us to grow plants and trees. The seas allow, allow us to travel and so on. Some provisions are obviously necessary for, sur for survival on this earth, such as food and water. So we end with this section and we'll start the fitrah, um, inshallah, in, a, um, in, in our next uh, session. Uh, Jazakallah khair. Uh, does anyone have any final thoughts? Yes, sister. Yeah, okay. So, yes, yeah, so go ahead. What, what is? Ah, excellent question. I, I should have defined. So, so physical. So there's, there's, there's a physical beings, right? So anything that's metaphysical are like truths that cannot be observed by like the, the senses. You know, like for example, the ruh, the soul is metaphysical, right? The jinn, the kareen, you know, the angels, they're metaphysical. You know, like, huh? The what? Unseen, yes, yes. Any anything that cannot be comprehended by the five senses is metaphysical. So that's why they, they you hear the term metaphysical truth, or you know a metaphysical discourse. You know we're talking about you know like um, people talk about the higher truths or the meta you know metaphysics. It's not like a, some weird physics. It's just you know um, you know spirit and unseen world and all of these things that we can't comprehend. But you know we know of th we know of them through revelation and Quran. So, like, the, the, what, what's up? Like, Metaphysical psychology? psychology like, not, not like, well, so, so secular psychology will never talk about me me metaphysical entities. So secular Western psychology will never talk about metaphysics or me metaphysical realm because in their mind it does not exist. The soul does not exist. God does not exist. You know, nothing, nothing exists that can't be sensed by the senses. So there is, um, um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that is, and if I were to look at um, a definition real quick, so metaphysical by the de definition, um, yeah, it, it means an, um, yeah, it means an idea, doctrine, 
posited reality outside of sense of human perception. Yeah, so anything that can't be perceived by the human senses is, is, is metaphysics, me metaphysical. Yes. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the ayah? I know, I'm, I'm, I'm having. Yeah. Oh, so I, I am not going to comment on any Quranic verses. That is a big no, no, no for me. We'll leave the, the Quranic uh, interpretations of the Quran and the, 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 the you know, tafsir and you know, the, the understanding interpretation to the people that are actually qualified. I'm just reading from a book and giving my own things when it comes to the psych psychology part and just kind of reading the Islamic part, you know, uh, whether, you know, like the eyes that talk about do not fear or grieve, you know, Allah mentioned to the Quran, in the Quran to Prophet Salam, you know, many times, you know, you'll kill yourself in the grief, you know, because they don't listen or, you know, don't despair, you know, don't, and, 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 and the idea is, you know, like if you have to go back to the uh, tafasir to under, get that understanding, um, you know, um, but, but, you know, essentially, I'm not going to comment on, on, on the verses. Yeah. There's a story about like a world-renowned embryologist mm -hmm. that was doing research on embryology. And I think he came across the Quran and where it talks about how in the Arab that looks back and goes to that or turns to a lump of flesh and bone. Then he was like so fascinated because he said, this can't be based on scientific knowledge of the seventh century. So from that, he realized this is something like greater, and he gradually became Muslim from that because he used the Quran as a source. Subhanallah, that, that, that's so beautiful. That's so powerful. You know, people are different. Scientific people will look at the scientific parts of the Quran. And they, Allah might guide them to the deen. Some people are more spiritual. They might be moved by the spiritual aspect of the Quran. Some people might be moved by the historical accounts in the Quran. You know, Allah has something for everyone in the Quran, all personalities. And a powerful point about pregnancy and like, you know, the embryology in the different stages. The Quran, you know, so basically now OBGYNs will tell you, you the, the fetus has to be at least minimum 25 weeks for, for, it, for it to have a chance uh, at living if with the most premature birth, 25 weeks. If you read the verse in the Quran that talk about, you know, the weaning, you know, basically um, the different stages of, uh, you know, uh, pregnancy and, you know, as well as the weaning of two years and all of those things. If you do the math and you take out all, you know, it talks about the different stages. If you do the math, it actually, the, the Quran actually says that it's six months. And, and that's interpret, you know, the scholars have deduced, you know, just based on when a fetus is viable, you know, the, the earliest that it can be born and still live and grow. And, and, and it is a miracle because how could the Prophet ﷺ know back then like 25 weeks is enough? That's impossible. And you can get that from the Quran just by doing the math. It even says the stages. The, the stages. Yes, yes. It, it gives all the stages. So, it's, it's, you know, Quran is a miracle. It's it's, it's a beyond a miracle. And, um, you know, may Allah make us of those who uh, reflect reflect upon it. Allah, I mean, subhanakallah, wa bihamdika, shalom, Allah, ilaha illa, and sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa alaykum, wa alaykum, wa alaykum, wa alaykum, wa alaykum, wa alaykum, wa ala